uh, something. Now we've been solving some of these quadratic equations in the last three sections, so make sure that you've we've watched those last three sections and you understand. But one of the types of equations that we've done has been something like x plus 4 quantity squared is equal to 9. Now if you've watched those last sections and you've worked those problems with me, you should know that this is easily solvable now because we have a perfect square on the left and we have a number on the right. So quantity squared is equal to a number. And how do we solve those? Let's go through it again, just in case you're rusty a little bit. We have a perfect square here, so we want to take the square root of both sides to get rid of the square that's here. When we take the square root of the left, we're, we're going to kill that, that exponent there, so we're just going to be left with x plus 4. On the right, we're going to have to have plus or minus that we add ourselves, square root of 9. Because when we apply a square root to both sides, we have to add the plus or minus, and we've, we've talked about why we do that in the past. So continuing with the solution here, uh, plus or minus on the right hand side, what is the square root of 9? It's 3. Okay. So now you want to solve for x, you're going to have to subtract 4 from both sides. And I'm kind of flying through this because ultimately uh, what you're going to have uh, here is something that will illustrate why we need to complete the square. So plus or minus 3, we're going to subtract 4 from the left and 4 from the right. So we subtract 4 from the left, that disappears, subtracting 4 from the right. There you go. Now we have two answers here because we have plus and minus 3. So x can be 3 minus 4, uh, which will be negative 1, or separately x can equal negative 3 minus 4, which is negative 7. So you have two answers here. Now a couple things we want to talk about before we get into completing the square. First of all, this form here, where it's a perfect square on the left, equal to a number on the right is really, really nice because it's always solvable, always. Now here we have a 9, so the square root is 3 and it's even nicer, but even if this were like 7 or 2 or some weird number here, fraction, you're still able to take the square root of the left and the square root of the right and you'll always get the answer. So having a perfect square on the left where all you have is a square term is really, really nice and on the right hand side with a number there. So that's what you're always striving for because we can always solve it. So I want to kind of take this example in the back of your mind and we want to study this. Let's study this problem. So what we started out with on the left was x plus 4 squared. And in this problem it was equal to 9 so we knew how to solve it. But for now let's don't solve it. Let's expand the x plus 4, right? So if you remember, if you have a binomial squared you can write it as x plus 4 times x plus 4 and do first, inside, outside, last terms multiplied and multiplied out, but we can also just use the shortcut. So since it's a binomial squared, it's the first term squared, x squared, plus 2 times the first term times the second term. So it's 2 times x times 4 plus the last term squared, 4 squared. So ultimately this is going to be x squared plus 8x plus what's 4 squared? It's 16. So all we did was take the left-hand side of this. We want to just examine it a little bit. That's all. So we expand it out, and this is what you all should get is the expanded, fully multiplied form of this binomial here that we have. But notice something really interesting. Let's take a look at this middle term, this 8. This is something that you wouldn't necessarily notice on your own, but mathematicians have noticed this, that when you start with a perfect square like this and you expand it, if you take this middle term, let's take a look at this. If we take um, the middle term, which is 8, and if we divide it by 2, and then if we square the result, I know you're thinking, why is he doing this? Just follow me and we'll get there. What is 8 divided by 2? That's 4 squared. What is 4 squared? 16. Okay. What we're saying here is that anytime you start with a perfect square and you expand it out, if you look at the middle term, whatever it is, if you divide it by 2, and square the answer, you're always going to get whatever the third term is there. In this case, it's 16. But if I gave you another perfect squared, like x plus 3 squared, if I multiplied it all out, if I took that middle coefficient, divided it by 2, and then squared it, I would always get the third answer, the third term um, there. So basically, what it's, what it's telling you is you can get the third term from the second term. And that doesn't work for, for all trinomials. That works for trinomials that come about as 
as you're squaring something, as you're squaring a perfect square like this. When anytime you have a binomial and you square it, it just so happens that the middle term, if you divide it by two and square it, always equals the third term. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, who cares? Why, why do I even care about that? Well, let me, let me give you the punchline and, and sort of tell, show you by an example. Let's say we were not given this equation to solve. Let's say we were given x squared plus 8 x is equal to negative 7. Let's say we were given that equation to square to, to solve. Now, there are other ways to proceed. You can try to factor out an x. You can try to move the 7 over here. That's actually what I would do, is I'd try to move the 7 over here, and I'd try to factor the result. Sometimes it might factor. Sometimes it might not factor. Remember, when we were factoring trinomials, sometimes the factoring worked, where we could pick the numbers, and sometimes it just wouldn't work. So that's what you would typically do if I just, forget about this lesson, if I just gave you this, you'd try to move that over there and try to, try to factor it and solve it. But you may not be able to factor it. But let me blow your mind here. Here we have x squared plus 8x. So let's go ahead and take this middle term. Let's take that 8, let's divide it by 2, and let's square it. And as you already know from before, that's going to give you 4 squared, which is going to give you 16. Now, remember, you can do anything you want to the left-hand side and to the right-hand side of an equation as long as you do it to both sides of the equation. As long as you do it to both sides of the equation. So let's go ahead and start over here. And just so I can get a little more room and just start over with what we, I'm going to kind of rewrite what we did here. x squared plus 8x equals negative 7. Let's say we were trying to solve this. I'm going to give you an alternative way. Let's take that middle term. Let's divide it by 2 because we know that we can do that. Square it. And that's going to give you 4 squared, 16. So, you know, I can add anything I want to the left-hand side of this equation as long as I add it to the right-hand side. It's still balanced. So let me add 16 because that's a special number. Let me add 16 to the left and 16 to the right. So what do I get? x squared plus 8x. I'm going to add 16 to the left, and I'm going to add 16 to the right. I've changed nothing. All right? But now notice what I've done. Forget about this on the right. On the left, I now have a factorable form that's always going to give me a perfect square. When I go back up here, remember that this guy came from the expansion of this. So I know if I factor this, I'm going to get a perfect square. And I already know that perfect squares in these quadratic problems are really easy to solve. So what I'm going to then do is rewrite this equation, x squared plus 8x plus 16. On the right-hand side, what is negative 7 plus 16? It's 9. All right. So now I'm going to try to factor this left-hand side. And I already know that it's going to factor, so let's put the x here and the x here. What times what gives me 16? Uh, 4 times 4 is 16. And I've got pluses everywhere, so I'm going to put a plus here and a plus here, and that's equal to 9. Notice that I have a x plus 4 times x plus 4, which I can write as x plus 4 squared equals 9. And I'm not going to go any farther down because we've already solved this problem, but this is solvable. All I need to do is take the square root of the left, take the square root of the right, and I can solve. I know how to solve this. Anytime I have a square on the left equal to a number on the right. But notice that I got it into this nice form from an equation that was not in a nice form. This is not a perfect square. If I move the 7 over here, that is not going to be a perfect square. It's not going to be easy to solve it. Um, by hand. There are other ways. I'll show you later how you can solve these things. But as far as by hand and by factoring, it's not going to be easy given this ugly equation to begin with. So what you need to do is think about this concept of completing the square as a way to make these equations very easy to solve. So what you do is you take the middle term, the x term, you divide it by 2 and square it. That gives you a number. You take that number and add it to both sides of the equation, right? And then you're guaranteed to have a factorable perfect square on the left, which is easy, easy to solve. Okay, so here's the method of what we call completing the square. And it's called completing the square because it takes this stuff, which is not a perfect square, and you add something to it to make it into a perfect square. So you're kind of completing that square. So there's some steps here to it. This is what you'll typically see in your book. It'll be x squared plus bx plus something here, right? Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to get rid of any coefficient in front of the x term. We'll get to some problems where we have to do that. And you can easily do that by dividing the whole thing by what you have in front of x. Okay, so then step one is you want to take that middle coefficient, b, whatever's in front of the x, you want to divide it by 2. Okay, the next step is you want to take whatever you found 
above and you want to square it. So you want to take b over 2, so this coefficient that's in front, you just want to divide it by 2 and then square it. And then you want to add whatever you got there to both sides of the equation because you can add anything you want to both sides and then you factor and solve. So you're guaranteed to have a perfect squared on the left, a perfect square on the left when you do it this way. So what I want to do now is stop because we have, I've kind of given you a motivation and an overview for what it is, which is really the hardest part to understand. That's what you're trying to do though. And then we're going to go into the next lesson, then we're going to solve a bunch of problems. You're going to see how easy it is to apply this. But instead of just blindly following a recipe, you're going to know what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. So now you have a good overview of what completing the square is. Now in the next lesson, we're going to go ahead and solve a bunch of problems to give you practice with the method. And you will be following these steps, but you're not going to be blindly following them with no knowledge of why they're useful or what they're doing. You'll understand what you're doing so that, so that as you solve the problems, you're not just like a monkey just trying to do things. You'll understand what you're doing. So make sure you kind of understand this. Watch this lesson a couple of times and then follow me on to the next lesson and you'll get that practice that you need in order to do well at completing the square. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.